We are joined here today in the second of our strange forays into public life where we meet famous people. Who appear to hide under duvets. Yes. Well, you know, it's called under the covers for a reason. He's, do you know in his dressing room he's got a bucket of green M&Ms and the, ho the whole nine yards is terrible. He keeps flicking them at passers-by. I thought he'd be eating them, you know what I mean? Anyway. Yes. Gary Russell. Yes. It's, it's, this we man is extremely famous, having been what the <laughs> one of the few names that stretched mm. across mm. the decades of Doctor Who. But we're going to start at the beginning of his career because not a lot of people know this, but Gary is, Gary is actually a child actor. I was. I'm well, not still a child actor. Well, you might be. That would be a little bit very freaky at the age of 48. Going, I'm still a child actor. <laughs> Let's go back to the beginning. Now I know you started out as a bit of a child actor. Yeah. In fact, in one of my favourite shows. Uh, I, oh, you're I, just saying. That. No, no, no. I remember. I remember. I remember many years ago. Is it true, right, that in all your career, all the parts you've played, played yes. how many parts did you play? Where did it start? Oh, I, I, um, I've done. I did theatre stuff, and then that led to TV stuff, and and it did, the typical sort of thing for for a child actor really is you go to drama class, and they start sending you up for auditions for things, and you go through this long period where they go well, we can't give you this job because you haven't got enough experience. And you go, well, how do I get the experience? Because I can't get the job. And this lovely sort of catch-22. And then one day I got a theatre job, which was brilliant. And I went on tour around the country. The very first thing I ever did in my professional career was on the stage of the new theatre in Cardiff. So, yes, I did this theatre thing. And then from that, I did a TV show called The uh, Phoenix and the Carpet. Mm -hmm. Um, and then from that did Famous Five. In my eyes and the eyes of everybody, because I'm 40 years old, and in, in our eyes you are the definitive dick. There is no proper response to no. that statement. What everybody wants to know, and this is the key, what happened to the dog? It died. Dogs do that. They don't live for really? forty odd years. You say. I mean, I'd heard that he went on to be a, a, as he went went on to a very successful career as a well, controller he, of ITV. No, no, no. I, I think for a while he was he was running the UN. Oh, fair um, enough, fair. I think that's what he did. He he sort of was up there and and organising things throughout the eighties, and then in the nineties. Um, he sort of moved on from the UN and went into the Middle East and tried to sort of create world peace and everything there. But so they thought he was a bit barking. Yeah. But the truth is, though, you you, you didn't actually do that many episodes. You did all the books. We did. We did. Books, did, we, did, um, we, did no, we didn't do all the books. Uh, we did twenty six episodes yeah. across two series. Uh, but we didn't do all the books. There's three books we didn't do. Okay. Any particular reason? The first book we didn't do, which is actually the very first story, uh, we didn't do because the rights were held by another company. Uh, the another story we didn't do for the, exactly the same reason the rights held by exactly the same film company and then there's another book we didn't do because frankly the story was pretty much the same as the other 21 books um, and they just went actually and they're right there wasn't quite enough story it's like Enid Blight was slightly on autopilot when she wrote this book and it's in the middle of the run it's not sort of towards the end we wanted to do a third series and at that point the Enid Blyton people didn't want uh, new, non-written by Blyton stuff, oh, I see. and I was always really quite annoyed because that would have been '78, and I think in '79 or '80, the Blyton Foundation suddenly turned around to some bloke in France and said, "Oh, I'll write a whole load of new famous five books." And it was like you wouldn't let us do a TV show in the middle of making it, but then somebody can do famous five go to a TV studio in France. Um, Bit unfair, really, isn't it? It was. We, yeah. we, 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 we rent our garments in, in frustration and anger. Going back to the Famous Five, I mean, yeah. as a child actor, you must have had problems with learning, going to school well, and all that sort of stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, Phoenix on the Carpet was done during school time, so all the time with that, we would have, when we would have a tutor with us. So when we weren't rehearsing, we would, we would spend sort of about three hours in the morning doing school work, and then we would rehearse in the afternoon, and in the morning they'd do the rehearsals with grown-ups. Famous Five was slightly different because apart from probably the first two weeks of the two shooting blocks, where again we'd have a tutor, they were done during the summer holidays. So it wasn't really a problem, um, and for us it was just, therefore, we were, we were in Southampton, we were in the New Forest. Uh, glorious summers, 77, 78, two brilliant summers. It was just four kids and a dog having an absolute ball, running around in the countryside, running around in woods, running around beaches, doing some scary things that I wouldn't necessarily ever want to do again. It's amazing what some will make you do when you're 13 years old. I was the oldest. <laughs> Shut up. I was the oldest of the kids, you see. I'm sorry. So 
whenever they needed to do any sort of padding or anything like that for an episode, they go, oh, quick, put put Dick in a dangerous situation because Gary can work longer than the others, he can work longer hours. So uh, so if there was anything involving heights, usually, yeah. they would say, right, we've got this brilliant scene and you're going to come out the top of the room, you're going to crawl along the front of the rampart. And this is years before sort of health and safety and things like that. And And there are episodes of Famous Five where you will see me on top of a building sort of, 30, 40, 50 foot in the air, no, probably about 40 foot in the air. Walking across the front of it with that much of space but, oh, that my foot is on, no ropes holding you anything, and I'm just going da 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 da. These days in television, it would all be done green screen. If you did have to on location, you'd have wires, they'd be painting out, there'd be nets, there'd be 18 people doing health and safety stuff. But that didn't exist back in the 70s. They just said, you got any problems walking along the front of that rampart, and me going, well, I'm absolutely terrified of heights <laughs> but because I love television so much I'll do it. I think it's children are replaceable aren't they? Well this is I think this was the general thought yeah. but you know what I wouldn't change it for the world. Well no no. I love it but yes we were I'm sure we were replaceable and I'm quite positive there were times they probably thought if we cut that rope ladder we can get rid of Gary. Dick's had a terrible accident and he's gone to hospital and had modern plastic surgery because you know, 1977 great plastic surgery and I could have come back as some sort of blonde blue-eyed well they would have used punk. Baker Lake back then wouldn't they? Tin foil I suspect actually. <laughs> There's these, these two summers burned into my memory where I could almost tell you what I did on every single day. I can watch an episode and go, did that then, did that then, that actor was that, that, oh, there was a bit where we did this there, oh, God, the dog fell over there, whatever. Yeah. It's all, it's all still up here. And well, it made you. me read every single Enid Brighton book. Literally every single one. From so, famous Live right, right through. through. Secret Seven, everything. So the yeah. secrets, I, I read them as kids, why I wanted to do the show, I was a big fan of Famous Five, and indeed Dick was my favourite character, so when the, I got the chance to play it, because originally it was going to get me to play Julian, and I was very excited when I finally got a chance to be Dick, and thought, yeah, that's the character I really like, because he's very sarcastic and stupid and smart ass, curiously, just like me. But I was a big fan of the books, but I couldn't bear the secrets that one. I really hated reading I read it all, seven. after Famous Five. Yeah. What happened next? Well, I did a, a couple of other tiny little TV parts, uh, I did a series called Dark Towers for um, television, which was for uh, for schools. Uh, I played Lord Edward Dark with ghosts and knights and things like that. Um, then I did a TV thing called Schoolgirl Chums with Lana Ward, who oh, ended wow. up being a Doctor Who, or already been a Doctor Who by then. Um, and then I went to the National Theatre for two years. It got me to my first ever trip to America was through really? there. We, we went over to, on tour to America. So, what, what so at the age of 17, 18, I think I was. I, you know, someone's paying for me to go to America, which was just like... So what, what parts did you have when you were there? Um, well, I was actually an understudy. Uh, they have, when they, when, those days at the National, I don't know if it's still true, those days at the National, you'd have the main cast, mm. and you'd have an entire cast of understudies, so that somebody could be dropped in at a moment's notice. And every so often, they would do a complete understudy performance, oh, well, which okay. is brilliant. So, so you, people would come and see the understudy performance. It's a great thing to be part of. It was a... I imagine it is the same now, but it was a huge company, it was a lot of fun, um, and you fe it didn't matter that you weren't going on stage and actually doing the part you were understudying. Um, we all got to go on anyway as, a sort of, as sort of extras at one point during, during the, the performance, so that was always every single night we were on stage. The person I was understudying uh, was never sick in, in 18 months, was never ill. You never felt you should just I push it. I was just so tempted. <laughs> but yeah, that took us to, 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 to Baltimore and Maryland and things like that. It was lovely. Great career to have. And then one day I woke up literally and went, you know what? There are a lot of really, really good actors around my age and they're all constantly getting a lot of film and TV work and I'm not as good as any of them. And once I'd realised in my head that I was merely capable as an actor, but I wasn't good, I was never going to be great, I was never even going to be good, I thought, no, I'll stop doing that. So I just gave up, literally, overnight. What? It wasn't what I should be doing because I wasn't good enough. Is that where writing came into? No, writing came a lot later. What I wanted to do was then work behind the scenes of TV. So I then got into the BBC and I spent many years at the BBC doing a variety of different jobs. While I was there, um, I got to know Alan McKenzie of Doctor Who magazine. He was the editor of Doctor Who magazine. I was editing the newsletter for the Doctor Who Appreciation Society at the time. And every month I'd phone him up and say, oh, what's the latest news, Alan? And we'd put it in and we'd put a little picture of the cover of DWM in. And then out of the blue one day, he just sent me a letter. Actually, he didn't phone me, he sent me a letter. I got this letter through the post saying, um, you're, you, you strike me as one of the most sort of erudite of the Doctor Who gang. Of course, now I look back at that and go, 
nice bit of charm bit of soft soapy at the time i was like wow that's really a compliment oh wow that's brilliant <laughs> cheers alan um but he said you know i'm looking for a new writer um to take over from richard land and doing all the bulk of the stuff on doctor who monthly as it was then are you interested uh and he got richard marston in doing interviews so it was just matrix data bank and a few features and and all that sort of stuff do you remember um, the issue you took over yeah the, my my first issue of doctor who magazine monthly is 86. It's got a picture of Peter Davison and Janet Fielding from Warriors of the Deep on the front cover. Alan McKenzie uh, therefore employed me to work on Doctor Who magazine and do some writing stuff and it was brilliant and that's how everything started for me where everything sort of s snowballed from there. I got to know people through inter Doctor Who magazine, started doing a few odd interviews particularly about books and then as editors came and went sort of myself and Richard Marston sort of stayed there forever. We, 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 we saw out uh, Alan, we saw out Kevin, we saw out Sheila, and then Freeman was there. Um, and John and I always got on, we both had a passion for, for Marvel comics. We, we just shared similar opinions on lots of things. Um, and I can't remember when it was, it, I mean, I can, I know it was 1991, but we, I think it, we were going up to a Doctor Who convention in Edinburgh or Glasgow, Scottish people will now kill me for getting those two mixed up. Um, and on the, the plane up there, don't ask me why we flew, but we did, um, he commissioned me to write my first ever comic strip. Not ah. comic strip, which is Party Animals, which you've got a panel of up oh, yes, on the wall I, there. I actually have a, a panel of that. The, this, is the, this is original artwork by Mike Collins from Party Animals, my first ever strip. Uh, with Captain Britain, yay, and Emma Peel, and... And Death's Head. Um, yeah, obviously Death's yes. Head, and, and just everyone you could possibly imagine generally in this. Uh, most of which, I have to say, uh, Mike added in, not me. I didn't write them in. Oh, I, yeah. I know I wrote Cap put Captain Britain in it. What about Absalom Dark? No, I think that's Mike putting there. All the Doctor Who references are Mike Collins's. Um, I said that the barman should be a, a, a demon, all this sort of stuff. But it was brilliant. So while he was commissioning me to do that, which is, I say, it's on this aeroplane up to, up to Scotland, he started to talk about what I wanted to do and would I ever go into Marvel as his assistant and I said of course I would I would love to be the assistant editor on Doctor Who magazine my brain going ha 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 Knight of the Long Knives as soon as I am there John Freeman will become my victim and I shall become the editor of Doctor Who magazine and rule the world um, which is pretty much sort of what happened um, no it isn't but but then a few th this went but on then for again, a while no one's seen John Freeman this is true this is true we, apparently he's in Lancaster really um but no, so eventually I did go in as John's assistant, uh, which would, was for issue 183 of Doctor Who magazine, which is the one with Alice Pearson's giant robot artwork on the front cover. That was the first issue I worked on. And then John, bless him, this, I started in November, and John, bless him, I started on the Monday? No, I started on the Thursday. And he said to me on the Friday, oh, by the way, I'm going to America, Chicago, Doctor Who convention on Saturday. Um, so I'm going to be away for 10 days. Um, so can you just see the magazine through the end and get issue 184 started? Bye. And I'm like, I have been in this company for less than 48 hours. I've never edited a magazine in my life. Cheers, John. <laughs> Um, but it was the greatest thing he could have done because it, I then had to get to know everyone in this company that I'd only sort of gone, you know that thing when you first go into a company and everyone introduces you and you go, I'm never going to remember anyone's names. Yeah. I got to know everyone's names very, very quickly because I had to rely on all of them to help me put this magazine together. And when John came back, he was so complimentary about everything I'd done and it was brilliant. And then I officially became the editor, I think, on 186, which had an Enlightenment cover. 